Spanish state prosecutors have just filed a complaint against the head of Spain's soccer federation, Luis Rubiales, for sexual assault and coercion after he forcibly kissed Spanish soccer star Jenny Hermoso during the awards ceremony last month after the Spanish soccer team won the Women's World Cup. Earlier this week, Jenny Hermoso filed a sexual assault criminal complaint against Rubiales, who has been temporarily suspended by FIFA. So far, Rubiales has rejected calls to resign. Protesters across Spain have taken to the streets to support Hermoso. This is a crime. This is clearly sexual harassment under Spanish law, and not only Spanish law, but also under European law. The Istanbul Convention, signed by Europe in 2011 and ratified by Spain in 2014, considers this as sexual abuse, and it is a crime. On Tuesday, the Spanish Soccer Federation appointed Monse Tomé to become the first woman to serve as coach of the women's national soccer team. The announcement was made shortly after the federation fired coach Jorge Vilda, who had long faced criticism for his coaching style. Calls for Vilda's resignation grew after he expressed support for Rubiales. Spanish soccer player Veronica Boquete said has become a Me Too moment for the Spanish sports. I think it's really similar to the Me Too moment. Uh, I really think that the, it's going to help to the change, because the change is already there. It was already before the, this World Cup and this uh, incident. Um, we are in a moment of uh, changing, and uh, I think that this can push us as a so society a little further and a little uh, faster. Amid this growing scandal, women soccer players in Spain have gone on strike in a dispute over pay as calls grow for the head of Spain's soccer federation to resign. Um, again, this in the midst of the uh, sexual assault scandal. The strike began after talks broke down between the Spanish Women's Soccer League and the Players' Union over pay and working conditions. According to the union, the minimum pay for women soccer players in Spain is about $17,000 a year, compared to about $192,000 a year for male players. This is Daphne Fernandez of the Players' Union. We have now finished the meeting, and the league has not offered a minimum that compensates the recognition that our players deserve. Therefore, there is no agreement, and the strike is still on. We're also now joined by Brenda Elsie, a co-host of the feminist sportscast Burn It All Down and co-author of Footballera, Women, Sports and Sexuality in Latin America, and editor of the book Football and the Boundaries of History. She's also a professor at Hofstra University. Welcome back to Democracy Now!, Brenda. It's great to have you with us. Let's start with the absolute top news that was breaking as we went to air, um, that Spanish state prosecutors have accused Luis Robiales of sexual assault and coercion for kissing a player on the lips without her consent at the World Cup uh, victory ceremony. Uh, so he's now apparently going to be criminally charged after uh, Jenny Hermoso filed a criminal complaint against him. But the world saw what he did. Can you talk about the significance of this moment in Spain and around the world? I can't think of a moment more significant, really, in my lifetime. This has been incredible, and I'm really truly sorry that this has happened to such a wonderful player. Yeni Hermoso is a, is a pillar of the women's football community and game. However, I am also very heartened by how much attention this story just won't go away. And that's because it's part of this real, as, as Veronica Boquete said in the earlier part of your segment, it's part of a huge problem that people have known that they've been working on and it's crystallized in this moment. And as much as the Spanish Federation wants to say, we did not see what we saw, we saw what we saw. Now, talk about the significance of, well, everything right now. You have the first uh, woman to coach the women's soccer team. She had actually quit the team. She had been on the coaching yeah. staff, um, but she quit among a group of other people on the women's soccer staff. 
over Coach Vilda and demanding a complete change in coaching. And now she has been brought back to lead the team. It's it, it's incredibly significant, and I think it shows two really important and exciting changes and progress. And one is the organization of women athletes as as workers. The labor union has been huge and key in continuing to press this issue um, with the federation, and so that has been incredibly important. And the other the other aspect to this, of course, is that. Look, I mean, the Spanish Federation wants to make sure that no structural changes really happen. And so this coaching is important. It's an important change. Everyone knew it had to happen. But they really need to, to have an institutional shakeup, not only in the Spanish Federation, but in FIFA. And we know this. So I think it's important to remember that, you know, it, it's not insignificant that you change a coach. It is very important. But at the same time, there needs to be independent governing bodies within global football that can respond to these, these like, widespread harassment, uh, not only of women, but also of youth players. Spain's acting minister of culture and sport, uh, Miguel Iceta, has voiced his support for Yane Hermoso's criminal complaint against Rubiales. Last week, uh, Iceta also called backed calls for gender equity and more women leadership in Spain's soccer federation, saying the shift in culture would be enforced under a new sporting law in Spain. Se acabó. Cualquier discriminación a las mujeres, cualquier obstáculo en el deporte. It's over. No more discrimination for women. No more obstacles for women in sport. It's over. It's over, and unfortunately, that happened because of an incident that should not have taken place. We are witnessing a real social and sporting backlash, which will make this a better country. And this is Spain's prime minister, Pedro Sánchez. He's acting now. It is true that there has been some behavior, in this case, that of Mr. Rubiales, which shows that in our country, there's still a long way to go in terms of equality and respect and the equalization of rights between women and men. So, this is very interesting. Even the prime minister cannot have him fired. And this has been the issue. I mean, they fired the coach who supported Rubiales, though he had so many other issues. Um, but they couldn't get rid of Rubiales. And another fascinating aspect of this is that in Spain, across the political spectrum, um, something like three quarters of the population is demanding um, his ouster. Uh, and let me just say, in this latest news of him being criminally charged, he faces something like um, one to four years uh, in jail and a fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's layers of bureaucracy here in terms of where this football governance lies. And I would say it's labyrinthine on purpose. The idea that, you know, is, the more confusing it is, the, the less accountable people can be. And so it is going to take efforts by people outside of football to hold him accountable. And that has happened also in places like Argentina, where they also went to the Ministry of Gender and the criminal courts in Colombia, where the women minors on the U.S. or I'm sorry, on the Colombian women's national team went uh, to criminal court over a sexual assault. Um, within the Federation. So this has happened again and again. They have to go outside of the structures. Rubiales cannot represent the Spanish Federation at this point. He is suspended by FIFA, but um, it will need to take the course of the investigation, according to FIFA. Uh, you could shrug your shoulders, but if, if anyone paid attention since 2015, it is it, they FIFA has found a way to avoid responsibility in many cases, both of of corruption, embezzlement, and also in terms of gender discrimination. So those things are tied together, I think. I mean, <clears throat> if you can talk about the Federation first going after Yanni Hermoso, um, mm -hmm. even threatening to sue her, accusing her of lying and defamation, now the Federation attempting to distance itself um, as, uh, you know, he is about to be criminally charged. I, it is it is just shocking. Um, it is uh, they are morally bankrupt. They have been for a long time. 
if they had w listened to women, you know, for the last eight years to the players, this wouldn't have had to happen, but they absolutely refused to make any changes. And, and this is what, what has happened. The fact that they have patterns of abusive and bullying and, um, you know, absolutely, they're just, there's such patterns of abuse that you can see, whether it's she said, he said, whether it's you didn't see what you thought you saw, all of this defaming her character. This this is classic behavior of predators beyond sport. And so we can see this all play out and it happens every day to people and we don't see it. But football gives us this window onto how abusers behave. And if you can talk further about the level of abuse um, against women soccer players, and uh, even just talking about what we're seeing now, instead of them being in a stadium of tens of thousands being celebrated, the women soccer players have chosen not to play, to go on strike, because they their minimum pay is $17,000 a year compared to male soccer players in Spain, minimum pay is something like $192,000 a year. And the women are the soccer stars. They just won the World Cup. And I, I hate to tell you, but that's probably one of the highest paid salaries of a women's football player in the world. <laughs> if you look at the minimum salary of the NWSL in the United States, you will also find it quite shocking. So it is, it, it is a pervasive problem. FIFPRO, the International Players Union, came out with a report right before the World Cup to document all the, the salary disparities that have gone, in, gone on in global football. And it is quite shocking. I mean, a soccer star like Marta never was able to play in her home country of Brazil because they've been un, unwilling to establish a, a profitable, steady women's league. Even though there's the audience there, of course, and the talent and the facilities and, and everything. So it is just abject sexism. It's it, with, with kind of the argument of the Federation about markets and things like that. But we know that they've actually engineered it to make sure that that market doesn't thrive by doing things like not selling women's jerseys, um, by not really creating sound contracts where women's soccer can be seen. That pay disparity is um, not surprising to me, but again, it, it, it's part of this really wide spectrum of neglect. It ranges from neglect to abuse of women's soccer. I bet there was not one single federation at the Women's World Cup this year that would say that they were truly happy with their federation and felt supported. Um, before we conclude, you mentioned in a previous answer that there are problems particularly with young players being abused. Explain, Brenda Elsie. Well, there's not many protections for minors. And we saw with Yeni Hermoso, an, in, an incredibly established player, that there was no possibility for consent on that platform. The highest ranking official in, in her sport, in her country, was able to harm her that way. And we have youth divisions in every single federation and they have complained about harassment, abuse, labor abuse, whether it's uh, boys being housed in Brazil that have unsafe conditions that lead to fires and sometimes even deaths, like we saw in Flamengo, or whether it's you know underage uh, girls, minors that have had sexual abuse, like in the case of Colombia. So I, I see it as a really wide problem. I think these Spanish women are tremendously courageous, and I think that will benefit all of this um, system ultimately, so long as we're keeping these these men's uh, feet to the fire. You mentioned Colombia, Brenda. Um, yeah. Earlier this year, you wrote about the crisis that's embroiled the Colombian women's national soccer team and the federation with multiple reports of sexual harassment and violence against women and girl players. Can you talk about this before we wrap? Yeah, unfortunately, despite uh, how wonderful the Colombian women's national team played, they have not been able to, uh, you know, better their conditions. And Ramon Hesarun, who is the head of the Colombian Federation and also a vice president of FIFA, uh, so part of the person that would be deciding on Rubiales, uh, himself has been under investigation both for financial improprieties, but also there has been 
um, convictions of coaches of the under 17 team. And yet these, this person has stayed in power. He's not only is he in power, but he's there to help people like Rubiales. So the Colombian Federation has very similar issues. What is exciting about the Spanish case is we're seeing all kinds of solidarity movements throughout the world, really, um, for Jenny Hermoso. So I hope it can translate into structural change now. Well, I want to thank you for being with us. And of course, we'll continue to follow all of this. Brenda Elsie, co-host of the feminist sports podcast, Burn It All Down, and co-author of Footballera, uh, Women, Sports and Sexuality in Latin America, and editor of the book Football and the Boundaries of History, also professor at Hofstra University, where she's co-director of the Latin American Caribbean Studies Program. And if you haven't left us, I just have to ask you one last question about Coco <laughs> Goff. If you were following uh, what happened at the U.S. Open, um, you had the protesters delaying her game by 50 minutes, demanding an end to fossil fuel. Coco Goff wins. She becomes the youngest to go into the finals, um, uh, an African-American tennis player, youngest since uh, Serena Williams, like, 21 years ago. Mm -hmm. And in her final comments, she actually supported the protesters. She said, even if it did jeopardize her and make her lose her concentration, they were peaceful, and she supports free speech. I was so thrilled. I can't tell you how how wonderful it was to to hear her support them. We can't expect that from athletes all the time, but when it happens, it's thrilling. And I think it's the it was so interesting in the top of your show, whether it's Nazi, you know, fighting Nazi chants being said or anything else. Um, we see we're seeing people using sports as a place to to debate and to protest and to struggle. And I love it. Well, well, I want to thank you so much for being with us. Again, Brenda Elsie of Hofstra University in Long Island, co-host of the uh, feminist podcast, Burn It All Down.